coming up, so I want to talk to you today about the real Thanksgiving. So here in the culture, one of the things that we do is we talk about it different ways. Okay, we say Turkey Day. Does everybody do that? Yeah. Turkey Day. Why are we celebrating a turkey? I mean, you know, what if what if the pilgrims would have been wrong and they shot a gold eagle? I mean, you know, would we a bald eagle? Would that? What if a turkey was a national bird and a bald eagle was what we ate for Thanksgiving? You know, and uh, so then we also have one. There's a there's a hormone or a chemical that's in turkeys and other things, and it's called tryptophan. And what it does is supposedly it makes you sleepy. So whenever you eat this big, huge meal, it's not due to the fact that you ate about a half a wheelbarrow's worth of food, but that you had one little tiny piece of turkey in amongst all of the uh, sweet potatoes with marshmallows on them, and then the you know, gravy, mashed potatoes, and everything else. And so we sometimes call it the tryptophan festival, because what it's going to do is it's going to overload our body, and we're going to go lay down. And so then it's also known as the day before Black Friday. How many of you are getting Black Friday ads? Some of you are still asleep. Okay. Uh, how about if we call it Be Nice to Relatives Day? Did you ever have, you ever had that where you had to go somewhere for Thanksgiving? You didn't want to go, but it was out of duty to mom or grandma. And uh, so you showed up and then you had to be nice to relatives. Uh, one of the things that also that happens is on Thursday afternoon and Thursday night, people will be camping out at Best Buy for the best deals of the day coming up. Have you ever seen that? Is that loony or what? I mean, you know, why do that when you just punch up Amazon? And so, I, I mean, it's incredible. So you're going to save five bucks while giving yourself a pneumonia. And so then we also have the thought that it's almost Christmas, but with better food. <laughs> Have you ever had that one? And uh, so, you know, we call it gluttony day, or we call it thankful day, or we somehow minimize what's really going on. So I want to talk to you today about the real Thanksgiving, and we know that it starts within our hearts, but there were people, and I need to give you a timeline, because that's going to establish the context for our understanding of what we're celebrating on this day. And so we need to go back to 1517 when a guy named Martin Luther, and Pastor Allen, thanks for letting me borrow the book, and I, I promised to return it. And uh, I won't sell our good book. Uh, so anyway, um, Martin Luther was a German monk. In other words, he had given himself to the study of scriptures. Uh, he would actually go on to translate the Bible uh, from the Hebrew and the Greek, and he would translate it into German. And this came about at the same time as the Gutenberg Press did with movable type. So it meant that they could readily publish books, I mean, by the thousands and millions. And so as this Reformation caught hold, and he thought there were some problems with the Catholic Church at the time, and so what he did was he wrote out 95 theses, or 95 statements that um, he posted on the cathedral door there in Wittenberg. And so that's the way that they started a debate because I guess he didn't have a Twitter account. And so they did that and then they were supposed to debate these 95 points and there are some. Um, is it true, one of them was, is it true that by purchasing indulgences, that your relatives can be released early from purgatory. That was one of the things he wanted to debate. Is it true that only the Pope can forgive sins? See, that's one of the theses. There's 95 of them. So what happened is, is the Protestant Reformation began in Germany, and then it went to Switzerland with Ulrich Zwingli, and then it went to England, and I mean, it went all over Europe. We kind of tend to think that all I had was ox carts and horses, but I mean, things went very rapidly and spread throughout the known world. There were some countries that resisted the Protestant Reformation. Uh, one of them was Spain, and another one was Italy. And so you had some other people, people like Huguenots, who were there who were uh, French Protestants in France, and there was a... Um, 
There was an edict that was put out by the King of France, and it's called the Edict of Nantes, N-A-N-T-E-S, that's a city in France. And he put that out and said, yes, we'll allow Protestants to live and worship in our, in our Roman Catholic country. And then later on, a later king did a thing called re the revocation of that edict. So if you have a king, then whatever he says goes until the next king does, and then he revokes that. So that's, that, what happened then was all of the Protestants left France. In essence, they all left France. That's where my ancestors come from. And they went from the city of Calais, which is in northwestern France, and they went north into what was then Spanish territory, but now it's called the Netherlands. And so they went there so that, because it was far enough away from the Spanish rule, that they could worship how they wanted to. And so whenever you look at these kind of actions where man tries to rule over the thoughts and beliefs of individuals, it winds up creating an absence of very skilled people. I've talked with Gerda beforehand, and uh, we were talking about how uh, there used to be a whole lot more Jewish communities and Jews in uh, Europe than there are now. And what happened was, is all of these countries wound up kicking or kicking out the Jews or killing them, and so they are lacking. Uh, have you ever heard of uh, somebody named Itzhak Perlman? Okay, great violinist, Jewish. Albert Einstein, Jewish. Uh, I mean, you could just go down the list of significant people in, in civilization, and you would find that God has endowed a large number of those. He has never, ever forgot his people, even though they have rejected him. He has never, ever forgotten them, and so they are still his children. So we're doing good by embracing even the modern day state of Israel. And so it's very important for us to see that, yeah, they may not be doing what we want them to do, but they are still God's people. So if you mess with God's people, you're going to get it. And so that's what happened to Nazi Germany. Can you imagine what would have happened in Nazi Germany if they would have quit all that transporting of people, building all of those humongous camps to incarcerate and kill them? And instead, if they would focus on the war effort only, I mean, they had jet planes, they had all kinds of stuff. I mean, they were the first to do rockets. You know, our, our initial space effort was based upon the actions of Werner von Braun and a whole bunch of them. And uh, fortunately, we got there before the Russians did and captured those guys. So we need to understand that you should not mess with what God is doing. I mean, that's a big lesson for us. That's why whenever we pray for our nation, we pray regardless of whether it's an R or a D or an I. I is for independent. It could be for idiot, but uh, uh, it's independent. And uh, so we don't want people thinking that they can rule the affairs of mankind better than God himself. Okay, so in 1603, this is after Henry VIII, he decided he didn't want, he wanted to marry somebody else. And so he told the Pope, uh, you're not in charge anymore. And so that was the start of the Church of England. And so Henry VIII also became popular by confiscating a lot of the lands that the Roman Catholic Church had. And he mandated that everybody worship in the way of the church that he had set up. So that's kind of a dangerous thing to do. And so what happened was, is a lot of people wanted to get back to God's Word. Now, there was at this time there was already a Bible in English, Old and New Testaments, and it's called the Geneva Bible. And even in your handout, I have put some quotes from the Geneva Bible, and we'll see them as we go through. This is important because the Geneva Bible had not only the text correctly translated from the Hebrew and the Greek, but it also had notes alongside. And the Geneva Bible is the one that the pilgrims brought to America. They did not bring the King James because they were all schooled in European uh, biblical thought and they brought the Geneva Bible. And you can still get copies of it today. And um, so it's really interesting to read the notes and it corresponds very closely with the way we think. So it's really good. Okay, so they mandated that um, in the Church of England 
They mandated that they would do the same rituals, they would have the same clothing, just change the titles and who's who. So a group that was opposed to those rituals and traditions in 1607, a bunch of them fled to, to the Netherlands, to the state, to the province of Holland. And so they did that. So a bunch of them went over there. There were already a bunch there. And so what they did was they actually, there's a plaque that's dedicated to the English church there in a city in the Netherlands. And I mean, it's really something. Is The pastor's name was John Robinson. And so they started living there and thriving because the Dutch people were very tolerant. And uh, so they expect, so they felt that the people could uh, worship in the way that they wanted, in the groups that they wanted. They could read the Bible. They could have discussions. They could do all of that. And so what happened was there was a group that, uh, that felt like, hey, our children are growing up, and they're just being like Dutch kids, and we don't want that. So I can't figure out what was wrong with being a Dutch kid. That's me. Um, and so I used to have a bumper sticker that says, uh, if it ain't Dutch, it ain't much. My brother-in-law, who's not Dutch, said, if it is Dutch, it ain't much. So, you know, you just have this. I had another one that I would have up in my office, and it said, have you hugged a Dutch boy today? So anyway, so we can see that there were some things coming up. So in 1620, right around there, they left the Netherlands, and they went to England on a ship called the Speedwell, and then they hired a ship, which was called the Mayflower, and I'm cutting it short. And so what they did was then they departed Plymouth, England, for the New World. And so if we could have a shot, there you go. So here they are praying on board uh, before they live. This is one of the original selfies. And uh, so, uh, so here they are. And the guy that has the book open, that's the Bible. Because these people were very biblically oriented. I mean, they wanted nothing more than to obey God's call. In a way, it strikes me they were a lot like Abraham. God called Abraham out of the circumstances he was in and called him to go to the promised land. And he didn't even know where it was. And so in November 11, 1620, after 66 days on the ocean, and there they were on this ship that was only 100 feet long. They had 101 passengers. One died. One was born. So the number came out even when they got there. They had 30 people in the crew. The ship was 100 feet long and 25 feet wide. So just to give you an idea, 25 feet would be from about here to that wall. That's how wide that thing was. And so it had three decks. And so if you can imagine how crowded it was, and they were going across in November, October and November, which all of the storms come out of the west on the Atlantic. And so they're fighting all of these winds and waves and everything else. And for you ladies, you need to know that there was no bathroom. <laughs> no bathroom. You just went up to the bow and did your business over the rail. Crew. But these guys were following God. And so they landed there at Plymouth, and they called it Plymouth later out of honor for Plymouth and England. And so in the winter of 1620, December, and that's what the picture is, they're still living on the ship. And so they lived on the ship, and over half of them died, and so many of the crew died, that the master in the account that I read was concerned because he would not have enough people to sail the ship back to England. So that's how many died. So probably if 130 came, then only 50 were left, which is amazing. And one of the children, a lady on board the ship, miscarried. And so there were a lot of other diseases like tuberculosis, pneumonia, and scurvy, which you get from not eating enough vitamin C, because they didn't know about citrus fruit. And so a lot of times in those days, what they would do to get enough vitamin C is they would consume large amounts of onions. <clears throat> and so 
if you can imagine with no bath for 66 days, living in cramp quarters, everybody eating on onion, <coughs> onions <coughs> until it ran out, you can imagine what it was like. But here they are in a new land. There's no Motel 6. There's no lodgings. <coughs> Excuse me. Coffee is a magic elixir. <laughs> it's one of the few legal drugs, and John Wayne drank it. Okay, so we need to understand that what we're looking at here is we're looking, looking at God's almighty hand working through all of history. Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, Philip Melanchthon, over into, over into Britain, we're looking at John Fox, who wrote Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, talking about the horrific martyrdom that was going on under some of the kings and, the, and queens in England. Uh, DC Talk, actually a few years ago, came out with a series of books called Jesus Freaks. And so you can, one of them has a lot of accounts of, from Fox's Book of Martyrs. And so whenever you read it, there's some things that will really give you pause. Do you really want to follow Christ? Uh, I don't know. Yes. The answer is yes. And so here they are. These people finally, winter is over. They get off the boat. So in spring of 1621, they go ashore. And it turns out that there's a village there already. But it had been wiped out by smallpox. And so they're walking around. Now watch God's almighty hand. Watch this. And so as they come ashore and they start, start figuring out where can we get some corn? Where can we get some, something to eat? They stumble upon these mounds on the ground, and it turns out that corn cobs were buried in there, and that the previous settler, the previous Indians had put there. And so they're <coughs> able to eat some of that, and then they repay the Indians later. But along the beach comes a guy named Samoset. And here he is right here. And he learned to speak English from the fishermen that would come up on the shores of Maine. And so this guy comes out of the boondocks, comes up to these guys and goes, hey, what's up, Holmes? <laughs> and, uh, so, well, maybe not. Uh, but anyway, so here he is. And so he tells them, go ahead and live in the houses. You guys look hungry. You guys need something to eat. Yeah, we do, we do. We passed the only Burger King out there in the Atlantic. And so they come, and he teaches them how to eat. He teaches them how to plant corn and beans. And he does everything, and he brings <coughs> along a friend of his named Squanto. And they teach the pilgrims how to live. These guys wind up living with the pilgrims for a number of years and helping them to get used to the new world. Now... Is this a, just a happy accident by the Chamber of Commerce? No, this is God's almighty hand. Remember, he said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he said, you're going to be my witnesses in Judea, Jerusalem, all these other places, and even over to the ends of the earth, but you've got to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. Well, that was before the day of Pentecost. So this is 1,600 years after Pentecost, and so here they are, they're following it, they're doing it, and you just watch what's going to happen. Here comes, in 1620, the foundations of our country, some of the values that we hold there, like you got to work or you're not going to eat. Uh, that's one. And so we just watch as this country is being formed, which is going to be an expression of God's grace and resources to evangelize the world. And so it's happening right here. What are the chances of them landing on an unknown coast, and here comes a guy speaking English? <laughs> yeah. In human reasoning. Zippo. Okay? So then, Samoset and Squanto get their chief of the Wampanoag Indians, and his name is Massasoit. And so they get him and bring him down, and he tells the pilgrims, he tells them, you can stay here and we will watch out for you. <clears throat> Protection. 
I mean, if you've got the Wampanoag Indians who rule that area and they're on your side, you don't, you have nothing to fear. And even they took some of the cannons that were on the Mayflower and they moved them ashore. Some of them were weighing about a half a, t a, half a ton, thousand pounds, and they brought them and they set them up in different places and they used that to defend, defend the settlement. Isn't that incredible? So they, they take and they have this Feast of Thanksgiving in the fall of 1621. Here's what it looks like. And they have 90 Indians and they got 50 remaining pilgrims. 50. So let's talk about the feast. What was the feast like? And once again, we've got to be able to see the hand of God in this. So I've got a text here, and I think I put it in your handout. And so here's the text. Let me read it to you. Our harvest being gotten in, our governor, his name was Carver, sent four men on fowling, hunting hunt birds, that so we might, after a special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruit of our labors. They four in one day killed as much as, with a little help beside, served the company almost a week. At which time, amongst other recreations, we exercised our arms. No, they went out and shot guns. <laughs> Many of the Indians coming amongst us, and among the rest, their greatest king, Massasoit, with some 90 men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted. And they went out and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation, and bestowed on our governor upon the captain and others. And although it be not always so plentiful as it was at this time with us, yet by the goodness of God, we are so far from want. Isn't that incredible? Yes. Yeah. I mean, what an incredible, incredible account. That was written by the governor. Uh, his name was William Carver. And so what we find is that God is moving in so many ways, and it's an honor in honor of these people and their desire to get close to him. But what are, some of the, what are some of the essentials of pilgrim faith? I've got them in your handout. The first one is this. Complete trust in the sovereign God. Complete. I mean, totally and completely. Can you imagine being 66 days across the Atlantic in the middle of storms and everything else, watching people perish at sea, watching a child be born, everything. In those conditions, I mean, and still you can trust in God. You're not going like, oh, I want to get off. Can't I get on that cruise ship, the celebrity, whatever, and go back home? I mean, we just watch these people that just, and by the way, before they could leave Plymouth, they had hired another ship called the Speedwell, and that's one that brought them from Holland over to England, and then they set out one time, with the speed well along with them, and it was so leaky, and they think that the master of that ship sabotaged the ship so that he wouldn't have to go to the New World. And they lost all their money, and they got, and they got tripped up by locals who betrayed them. I mean, these people pursued. You know, so whenever we talk about sticking with Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, they were not talking about some concept that may not prove out. They were talking about reality. They had no place to go. They all got arrested one time when the master of a small boat that was going to take them out to the Mayflower betrayed them. And they couldn't go home because they had sold their homes. And it was not a nice time of year in England. I mean, just to go through what these people went through, following God, you know, should give us a lot. So the first thing that they did that we need to know is that they had a complete trust in the sovereign God. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? How many of you are facing something you're asking God, can you do this? Anybody here? Yeah. How about the next thing that they did as part of pilgrim faith? The essentials. It's valid for us as we ride the cultural currents in our country. One of the Fun things I've had more fun watching than anything else was watching Kanye West taking the message of Jesus Christ to a prison. And then the atheists, they were all uptight. Uh oh, no, you can't bring that stuff in here. So he said, in essence, get lost. 
So, I mean, could it be that there's a revival happening? Did you know that he's selling this place out there in West Hollywood or wherever he lives? Because of the oppressive government rules about housing for the homeless on his own property. And he's going to move somewhere. Colorado, Texas, Arizona, somewhere. Isn't that interesting? And then the other day, last Sunday, he was on with Joel Osteen. Is that not a humongous audience? And he's a friend of the president. Okay, pursuing God's plans for the spread of the gospel. So go, therefore, and make disciples. And so that's what they're doing. So they're going out because they were restricted by the rules of the day. So they're going out. The other thing that they did, number three, was that they were focused on becoming mature believers. Part of the whole pilgrim mentality at the time was examine your heart yourself and grow closer in grace. If you read their writings, and I have, uh, the Puritan era, you'll find that they all focus on the heart. One guy even wrote a book called Heart Furniture. In other words, what is your heart supposed to look like as you pursue Jesus Christ? It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. But you've got to become a mature believer in Christ. You're going to have to do the proactive, persistent pursuit of an improved relationship with God himself through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot do it without the Holy Spirit. You cannot. Hebrews 6, 1, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. You don't have to go back to the starting place. You just have to keep moving. Amen. How many times do you think that they wanted to turn the ship around? How many times do we want to turn our ship around? Oh, this is so hard, God. I just don't know if I can do it. Now you ask. Okay, so what are some action steps that we can do instead of just spooning more dressing under our plate? Okay, there's something that we can do. We need to give thanks always, and we always need to give thanks. It says in Ephesians 5.20, it says that we are giving thanks always, and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are always thankful people. The attitude of gratitude starts within you. Amen. You have to choose to be thankful. That's an important thing. We're not just thankful for mommy and daddy and Uncle Billy and all that stuff. What we are is we're truly thankful to God. So how do we do it? So first one is we got to thank God for planning your existence before creation. Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God knows who you are. If you're here today and you believe in him, God chose you. What about all these other people out here? Sometimes God has chosen them, but they have listened to the voices of the world, like that one song that we sang, that people don't think you're good enough. It does not matter. Because God, in Jesus Christ, said you are not only good enough, but that you are accepted, you are secure, and you're going to be significant. Amen. That's what God says about you. The second thing that we do that we've got to do as an action step is we need to thank God that His Son died for you. What an incredible concept. I have two sons and a daughter. <coughs> I don't want either one of my sons dying for you. See, that's one of the reasons that we honor veterans is because they choosingly went into harm's way. And let me tell you, anything that you do in the military, you are in harm's way. They have mass equi massive equipment that will crush you in a heartbeat. They have ways that they can kill you by machinery, by boats, by aircraft. They, you can be on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier and the jet blast and blow you over the side. 
happens. I have friends of mine, I have one friend of mine, that he went down on the USS Scorpion in 1968. The wives of the sailors on that ship were standing on the pier waiting for the boat to come back in. It never did. It seemed like a safe thing to do. So did the people on the Titanic. They thought it was a safe place to be as they went across the ocean. But whammo, you have to have your trust in God. You have to know that his son died for you while you were still a sinner. That's why we have a cross up over on the wall. That's why we don't have a figure of a Jesus hanging on there because he rose again on the third day. Amen. It's not so much the cross. The cross secures for us the right to have a relationship with God again whenever we believe in Jesus Christ by faith. But the real celebration is on the third day. Yes. On the third day. Somebody once said, what do you want to hear whenever you're laying in a casket? <laughs> the thing I want to hear when I'm laying in a casket is people standing there looking, going, look, he's moving. <laughs> <laughs> See, we need to understand the significance of the blood that was shed on the cross for us. That's why next week, whenever we partake of the Lord's Supper, that's what we're going to do. We're going to use Jesus' words. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Amen. And I'm sealing this with the blood of my own body. And this marks the sealing of a new covenant between God and man. That we can now, by believing in Him, we can have a restored relationship with God the Creator that was broken in the garden. The next thing that we need to do is we need to thank God for giving us His Word, the Bible. Amen. Do you realize that Tyndale, who was an early translator of the Bible, was killed by spies from the Church of England? <coughs> Wycliffe, who was another translator of the Bible, he was also killed by people because they translated it out of the Latin into modern day English. Miles Coverdale was also killed for translating the Bible. And he said, I want every plowman in Britain to be able to read God's word. So they killed him. They killed him. <laughs> we, we're into the smartphone era. But do you realize what it was like to put the written word of God in the hands of those that had never ever learned to read? And so they were so hungry that they started reading the Bible and they learned how to read. You know that for civilization, that was one of the key steps, was the translation of the Bible into the English language and to the other languages like German, Swiss, French, whatever. The principles and the values contained in the Bible were the thing that transformed Europe and have changed all of civilization. Islam hasn't, hasn't furnished anything. Well, maybe one thing. In, in algebra, they, they created the concept of zero. But if you look at the Quran, and if you read it, you're not going to find anything that values life like we have in God's Word. Let us create man in his own image. Let's put the breath of the Holy Spirit in man. We're not going to put it in dogs and cats. But we're going to put it in man. So that we can have fellowship with him. Can you just imagine the conversation there among the Trinity? Wow, that's going to be so neat. We're going to create something. We're going to call it mankind. And we're going to watch as they populate this whole created earth. 
and we get to fellowship with them. <clears throat> yes. You know, sometimes people worry about the devil. I don't worry about the devil. He's going to do what he's going to do, but my God is higher than he ever would be. And my God is stronger Amen. and mightier than he ever was. Right. And so whenever the devil is harassing you, and people say sometimes, Pastor, the devil's really after me. My answer is, quit running. Turn around. Use the weapons of the warfare out of Ephesians 6. I got it on the helmet of salvation. I got the shoes of gospel peace. I got the breastplate of righteousness. And I got the sword, which is the word of God. Jesus even taught us how to do it. He said, get behind me, Satan. There is not a demon behind every bush. Sometimes people so focus on the enemy that they wind up worshiping him instead of defying him. We used to sing a song, Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his own precious blood. He loved me before I ever knew him. And all my love I owe him. The next thing is, thank God for the constant abiding presence of his Holy Spirit. Sometimes we say, Father, we want the Holy Spirit to fall today. And I can imagine in some way that he says, he's already there. He's already in you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is where the Holy Spirit dwells. That's what's so radical about Christianity is the great God who is transcendent and overall in triunity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now dwells within you to equip you, to encourage you, and to do everything else. You've got to have the constant abiding presence. Why don't I have it? Does he leave? No. You, with your own patterns and traditions, block him out. We have a bunch of people in Christianity today that say, well, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they all stopped at the end of the apostles whenever they all died. Who said that? Nobody. It doesn't say it anywhere in God's Word. That's a traditional viewpoint. Constant from God means constant. Amen. Does not mean temporary. He didn't say, well, you're going to have an on-again, off-again relationship with the Holy Spirit so that you can do great things whenever you're in a big meeting and it'll make you look good. He's going to teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I, Jesus, have said to you. Amen. Everything. Jesus even said this one. Think about this. Greater things than what I have done, you're going to do because I'm going back to the Father. And so the Holy Spirit's coming. Is that true? Yes. What is the most difficult thing? Feed 5,000? Nah, call up a caterer. Walk on water? Nah, get some more skis and a fast boat. What is the most difficult thing? How about to change a human heart? Right. That's the most difficult thing. How do we do it? We love, and we look for opportunities by the Holy Spirit to just love. We're not supposed to be kingdom sheriffs. We're not supposed to be prosecuting attorneys. We're not even supposed to be defense attorneys. Don't make excuses. Find the words from the Holy Spirit to be able to share with them and watch as lives change so that whenever they come out, like Lisa told us, about the man coming out of treatment and his wife had experienced the joy of the Holy Spirit in the waiting room, and instead of her being mad and angry that her husband was sick, she's smiling. And he comes out and wants to know, okay, what's going on? Yeah. One guy said, love your enemies. It'll totally confuse them. <laughs> Jesus didn't say that, by the way. Jesus just said, love your enemies. Okay, and the final thing today, set your hope in God and share your story. We had a story... Uh, it's a microphone. We had a story shared today about 
about somebody working in an environment at the hospital, treating patients, taking the time, took four days to be able to pray and ask God what they needed. And then after the second day, as she's praying, the lady decides that she's going to get her Bible, get it out, and start reading it. Yeah. Is that not amazing? It is. is that not the Holy Spirit at work? Yes. Can that happen in our own lives? Yes. yes, indeed. You go up, you go to the market, you come through the line, and you go, you look at the checker, and you go, boy, you look really stressed. He goes, yeah, I got a lot going on. You know, well, let me just pray for you. It works. We've been doing a lot of home renos. We're trying to get HGTV to come and fill it. <laughs> Not. <laughs> yeah, we want them to pay for it. Instead of Chip and Joanna's Jerry and Emma. And so I have a couple of favorite people in the paint department at Home Depot. I love them. They do great. They give me fantastic information. They help me do stuff. They make decisions. They do all kinds of stuff. They give me good guidance. Why? Because I love them. I don't even know them apart from Home Depot. You see, but whenever we love, then God works in miraculous ways to transform lives. Not only does it transform the life of the person that you're talking to, but it transforms your life, too. And that's the biggest, and you can't do it without the Holy Spirit. You can't have the Holy Spirit unless you believe in Jesus Christ. And you can't believe in Jesus Christ unless God begins to work in your heart by the Holy Spirit so that you become oriented towards Him and not rejecting Him. Because you're concerned about what will people think? Your old traditions. How about what will mama think at Thanksgiving dinner when I tell her that I've been going to church? I bet your mama would be happy. I bet your mama would be happy. Okay, action steps. One more time. Thank God for planning that you were supposed to be here at this hinge of history. All of your experiences that brought you here are part of God's plan. Even we got people here from Needles, California. <laughs> Can anything good come out of Needles? You know, the, answer, the answer is yes. Thank God that his son died for you and rose again while you were still a sinner. Amen. And thank God for giving us His Word, the Bible. If you want to know about anything, you can find the principles or the actual conduct right there in God's Word. Amen. But you've got to read it. It'll be important. And then most of all, you've got to be thankful for the constant abiding presence yeah. of the Holy Spirit. So that whenever you're sitting and talking with somebody or you're getting ready to do something, or you don't want to be in fear about what's going to happen in the future as you're stressing out, you just need to recognize that you need to put all of that aside, and you need to allow the comforter to comfort you and guide you. What a great thing. I mean, we got the Holy Spirit. We got Jesus Christ. We got God the Father. All of that matters. Then finally, what you need to do is as people around you are talking negative, and I told you before, don't hang around with negative people because they do not create anything, they destroy. I can destroy you by words that are negative. You never do anything good. You always mess up. Don't use those words with your kids. Don't. Don't. Instead say, hey, can I show you how to do that? Can I help you do that? You're going to have to do that yourself, but let me give you some hints. Hey, that looks pretty good. You can tell them. You can encourage them. But you see, you're going to have to set your hope in God. Amen. And I'm not just talking about, well, I can hardly wait for the second coming. <laughs> Jesus oh, already came once. He is coming back again. But we need to live in here now. Yes. Yes. We need to live in here now. And 
we have a way for us to be able to do it. In Psalm 78, 5 and 7, he said this. He said, he established a testimony in Jacob. There it is, up on the screen. And ordained a law in Israel, this is out of the Geneva Bible, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach their children, that the posterity might know it, and the children which should be born should stand up and declare to their children. Have you told anybody? I'm a secret Christian. Impossible. <laughs> Impossible. They'll know. They'll know. And the reason is that they might set their hope on God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments. That's the Bible the pilgrims read out of. And that's the Bible we're reading out of. Amen? Amen. Thanksgiving. Real thanksgiving. Not just thanking God for minor things. Not understanding that it's a tryptophan festival. Not understanding that it's gluttony day. But understand that one day out of the year, we officially give thanks which should be an everyday thing for us. Amen? Amen. 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 Stand with me.